you want burgers, hot dogs, some chicken, and ribs. Yeah! So if you went to Japan uh-huh. and you saw some panda bears. Okay, panda bears. <laughs> in the wild. Like you say you say panda bear like all adorable. Do I? <laughs> You're like some panda bears. Well, if you saw a panda bear. Okay, a panda bear. <laughs> in the wild. Okay. Would you try to cuddle it? I don't think that's advisable. I, I they're bears still. That's the thing. You but know? are they? Yeah, because I mean polar bears look uh bearable. No. <laughs> Polar bears, polar bears <laughs> are evil. Well, so are panda bears. Technically, I don't, I don't think, think panda so. bears are cuddly. I don't think are you're you supposed. Sure? To, I really don't. What think... if you just bring some bamboo? I don't think you're supposed to just go cuddle a panda bear. Well, By the way, don't we're... take me to Japan then, because I'm going to cuddle <laughs> a panda bear. By the way, we are a podcast, so please do not take any advice <laughs> from us. But I'm very sure that you can safely take the advice that if you see a panda bear in the wild in Japan. Please don't go cuddle it. it. And are panda bears native to Japan? I'm not very, you know, we're talking about J- Japanese horror this month. I'm not really well known with the <laughs> the panda bear population in Japan. Is that a Japanese look at? Or I, I thought panda bears were like China. Isn't it's all one continent? Nah. <laughs> no. Japan's an island. <laughs> Anyway, the, off of the continent of China. No, I mean not China, Asia. <laughs> I'm not good kinda, at the maps. Kinda. Anyway, I am not Google Maps. Okay. Anyway, welcome to Night of the Horror File. As you can tell, it's a, a, a podcast hosted by two white people. No, <laughs> no. Per, exactly. <laughs> but welcome to Night of the Horror File, a horror movie and genre film podcast where I take a horror movie and genre film and show it to my beautiful wife, Brittany, who then gives us her input because she dead. Well, I mean. I really don't. I've noticed that your catchphrase that we started the show out with, I haven't seen anything, is now gone. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've seen some things. The, yeah, you've literally seen things now. And if so uh, she gives us her, her input, though, because uh, she's like the outside, the, you know, the outsider to this genre that we all love, you know, gives you guys who are casual viewers a little bit to work off of. Because if it was just me, you'd kill yourself. Now. <laughs> <laughs> now, what did we watch this week, though? <laughs> I don't want to say it wrong. You don't have to say it wrong. I will get to the pronunciation thing because I've saved it until this episode because it's something that bothers me. Okay. So you can just call it ring. It's okay. Ring? Yeah, you can call it ring. It's fine. Okay, not the ring, but Not the ring. ring. The ring is the remake. Okay. <laughs> Again, podcast is by two white people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ring. Yeah. (laughs) Ringu. From 1998. So back in 1991, Koji Suzuki first published the novel Ring or Ringu. Um, And like I said, I'll get to that whole pronunciation thing a little bit later because it's something that kind of bugs me just a tad. But anyway, it was the first of a trilogy, actually, followed by Spiral in 95 and then uh, Loop, I believe, in 98. Now, first of all, the word ring doesn't actually refer to the ring you see inside of the videotape, which I don't think you even see it in this one, in the Japanese version. I think that's more relegated to the American version. There's a a ring-looking image that pops up on the screen in the American version of the ring that came out in 2002. Oh, okay. I never yeah. thought it was named after that anyway. Well, a lot of people think it is. But then then they see this. They're like, there's no ring in the ring. It refers to the curse as being like a cycle, like a ring, a cycle. Anyway. Yeah. That's a side point. <laughs> if but, they didn't catch that, I don't know how. Because uh, you caught it. Of... But, you know, we don't we don't want to, you know, there might be people out there that don't get it. And that's fine. That's fine. That's what we're here for. It's okay. Sort of. We're not really here to lead you through a movie. You should have already seen this before you came to us. <laughs> that's true. That's but true. anyway. That book sold about 500,000 copies, becoming moderately well-known uh, in Japan. You know, Of course, just like with American horror novels, uh, an adaptation was sure to follow. And uh, Suzuki actually approached 
the director today, Hideo Nakata, uh, and really wanted him to take over this. And after reading the novel and watching the Japanese television adaptation of Ring, yes, what? yes, there was a Ring movie before today's film. That's right, you guys. Oh. Yeah. So some of you out there saying this is the original Ring. Yeah. You're wrong. Yeah. No, I'm just- <laughs> uh, not, not one single person can know everything. Okay. So sit down. <laughs> okay, Lee. I know. But Ring from 1995, uh, it was a TV movie, and it's considered a more accurate adaptation of the novel. Uh, Supposedly, that one hasn't been released outside Japan, as far as I know. But um, after taking in these two mediums, uh, screenwriter Hiroshi Takahashi, uh, who would go on to write Sodom the Killer and uh, work on Jew on the Grudge as well, uh, and the American sequel to The Ring. Um, Okay. And also uh, Hideo Nakata. I think they both went on to work on that uh, sequel to Ring because Hideo Nakata directs the American sequel to The Ring. So so technically, Hideo Nakata would go on to direct a sequel to a remake of his own movie. <laughs> okay, then. That's Who, cool. Who's confused? <laughs> Me. But anyway, anyway. So these two guys, Hideo Nakata and Hiroshi Takahashi, they set out to work on uh, this movie together. They co-wrote it. This is pretty much the first cinematic version of The Ring. So, you know. You're technically not wrong when you say this is the first movie. Okay. Uh, but anyway, uh, with a budget of the equivalent of 1.2 million American dollars, which, was, by the way, was mostly provided by Nakata himself. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Uh, they took nine months and one week to make today's feature. Holy shit. Uh, Nakata stated that the script and pre-production took three to four months of that. Um, so, so yeah, see what happens when you dedicate some time to story. <laughs> right. <laughs> you, you see right. what happens there. But <laughs> shooting took about five weeks. Okay. You know? uh, so you you could consider with that 1.2 million, you could consider today's film low budget, sort of. But really, that's just because we are bloated Americans and we're used to our movies costing in the triple millions. <laughs> tri- tri- triple millions. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I've never heard it referred to like Triple that. millions. Like, I think the last Marvel movie was $400 million to make. Ugh, that's mm. disgusting. Uh, yeah, that's. Oh, we anyway. could save so many people with that. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway. And actually be superheroes, not like <laughs> fake superheroes. But that's not fun. Then you don't get to see Robert Downey Jr. on screen. Or wait, he's dead. Never mind. Not, not Robert Downey Jr. Robert Downey Jr. I was is like, very much alive. <laughs> who? I was like, what? No, no, he didn't pass. But anyway. <laughs> no, today's movie is more of a mid-budget film. You know. Uh, Hideo Nakata has said in, in an interview that he was like, I, I don't consider it low budget because it's about right for what <laughs> for a regular movie to make during that time. You know, 1998. Today's feature combines the te- a slight technophobia, too, as well. You know, yeah. that, that has been a pers- like it seems like it has been a running theme this month. Right. <laughs> technophobia. <laughs> but it combines a little bits of that with classic Kaiden, uh, which we talked about the, uh, the Kaiden stories in uh, part one. Like definitely part one of our two part mini series this month. Um, we we also talked uh, in that two part series uh, about uh, ghosts. You know, we we're dealing with Japanese traditional ghosts and stuff, and we'll we'll discuss this as we go. It we are definitely dealing with today's feature is a definite mix of traditional and modern. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It, and it's it's all throughout the movie. It's actually it's very cool when you like it, it, so many layers to this movie. <laughs> you don't have to know a big a bunch of background for this movie because, first of all, it has a damn good story. Right. I think that's the biggest thing that it has going for it is that so the story is really good and it's a mystery. You right. Know, if you take away the horror elements, this is a really good mystery. <laughs> It is. I didn't even think of it like that. Back on the title. Uh, Ringu is what you'll hear a lot of people in America say Mm -hmm. when they refer to this one. And that's mostly due to the marketing of this movie when it came out in 2003 after that American remake. Uh, Because we needed a way to kind of separate this one from the remake because Americans get confused too often. Uh, Ringu is just the Japanese pronunciation of the Japanese word. Ring. Right. Yeah, so that's all it is. Like the Japanese spelling, the characters and stuff spell out the word ring. 
Ringu is just how you pronounce it. And that's even kind of dicey because I've heard it pronounced two different ways. I've heard it pronounced Ringu uh, or Ringua, like a Ringua, you know, like a schwa sound with that U. So right. so even that's a little dicey because technically that's not a word. <laughs> Ringu isn't a word. So technically what you're seeing when you see Ringu is marketing. That's all you're seeing. That's just so we can separate it from the American remake. So so none of this really fucking matters, really. You can call this movie whatever you want. I just thought I'd kind of clear that up a little bit because for now on, we'll probably just call it Ring just to, <laughs> just to save some time right. and not sound like crazy people saying <laughs> Ragu. <laughs> Raggy. Raggy. Ringu. 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 Because we're not pronouncing it right as Americans. So <laughs> no. let's just stop no. this. Okay, everybody. <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> sorry. So with all this in mind, we got some, we got a lot of discussion, I think, today, just like last week. Uh, so let's dive into 1998's Ring. So two women, you know, curse you and put you in a well and kill you. <laughs> I've been thinking about that one for days. Are my fingernails going to come off? Well, I, I hope try so. Try to scratch my way. That's I, why is that the single most terrifying thing to this ghost that she has no fingernails because she tried to claw her way out? That's fucking scary. It's scary and very sad. <laughs> yeah, it's very sad. We'll, we'll get to it. It's a very depressing, scary feature today. But anyway, yeah, yeah. Uh, this film, of course. Like I said, had that remake that exploded here in America. Uh, when Gore Verbinski brought us that remake, we hadn't seen anything like it before. But to me, I feel like it's lost its punch and become funny. The remake has. Oh, <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. With tons of parodies following its release, I feel like the remake became less scary and more of a comedy to me. Not saying it's a terrible movie or anything like that. I actually think it's still a very, it still holds up as a good movie. Right. But for some reason, when you watch this, it's not as good. <laughs> it <laughs> ruins the movie for you because I saw this uh, when it came out in theaters, um, the remake. And I had oh, I didn't even know anything about Japanese horror at the time. I didn't even know there was a Japanese ring. I thought this was a strictly American thing. Right. So like and, and it seemed like that type of horror just came out of fucking nowhere. Yeah, like I agree. it just dropped on us. So it seemed it seemed like well, all of a sudden, hey, we're getting good horror movies. But you actually saw the remake, and by the way, I did. You, and by the way, you guys, we go in depth on this more on shooting the shit over on the Patreon right. uh, feed. So if you want more of that conversation, go over there. But but you did see the remake, and uh, so so she can make comparisons here. And I want to know at the end of this episode, you got to let me know which one you think is the better movie, even though we don't typically do that, you know, because we, I, I like to treat remakes and their originals like separate movies. That way I'm not disappointed, but, <laughs> but I, I kind of want to do some comparisons today because with me, I have a strong, strong, like not dislike, but I'm really hard on American remakes of Asian movies. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? I'm much harder on those horror movies than I am our own horror movies because I like hot garbage. So, right. so but for some reason, I'm really harsh on those things. So we'll, we'll kind of talk about that at the end there. I, so keep that in mind. Anyway, two women are watching TV and one of them starts telling a story about how a boy recorded something on a VCR mm -hmm. and he didn't record what he thought it was. And when he played it back, there was a woman on screen and she said, you will die in one week. The kid stopped the tape and the phone rang and someone said, you saw it. And the kid died a week later. The other girl says she, she actually saw a video like this and she got a call too. And she said it was a week ago today. And then she jokes and says that it's just a prank. First off, <laughs> first off, first off, I got to tell you, you guys are going to hear us giggle every once in a while because we are, we have uh, Elvira's 40th anniversary marathon on in the studio while we're doing this so if you hear us giggling it's because elvira's on the screen so right now she's twirling some she's tassels, twirling some with, tassels her titties. with her titties and it is it's i got a little i got a little mesmerized there for a minute i was just like what is happening <laughs> what oh what is at? happening <laughs> so anyway we we apologize ahead of time but i didn't want to miss this and i also wanted to record so <laughs> this is what you get but anyway anyway how much 
nostalgia hit you in the fucking face with this VCR. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I guess not enough to want to put a VCR in, or a VHS in a VCR. No, no. And did I tell you I finally had that explained to me why people keep buying VHS? I don't know. Videotapes. It's it's all for the art and the nostalgia. It has nothing to do with quality. I thought it was a quality thing and I was calling people out on it. <laughs> and so now, you're being an yeah, asshole. And I was being an asshole. So I want to formerly, for, formally, <laughs> formally, formally, don't worry, there weren't any tits on the screen, <laughs> formally <laughs> apologize for, for being a dick about VHS because now I kind of get it. Because I collect shit like that, so <laughs> I totally get what you mean. So anyway, anyway, though, but I, I remember, like, videotapes and shit like that, and and there was really a, like, it wasn't so much talked about, and I don't know if this is everybody, but I remember me and my friends talking about how, like, uh, you know, you might find a, a secret videotape or something like, and you don't know what's on it because that was a thing. You yeah. Would, you would find blank videotapes. What the fuck's on this thing? Yes. <laughs> is it, is it a movie? It, is it, is it mom and dad fucking? I don't know. So, so <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. So you roll the dice. Oh putting my gosh. That videotape in. I remember one of my chores being, um, I don't know. This is very weird being a chore, but I had to get all the VHSs together and I had to play them and then I had to put a piece of tape on it and write what it was. Why did you, why did people not just write what it was when they recorded what they did? Cause that's oh, what my dad, I don't did. know. My dad was like a maniac about that, about labeling the videotape. <laughs> so you knew it was on them. I don't know, but my parents recorded a lot of um, TV shows that they uh -huh. liked that they would miss. Like if they go out, or right, we're at work right. or something. And so I, it was my job to figure out what TV show it was. And like, if I could figure out like what episode it was. <laughs> oh, damn. You had yes. To, that's terrible. <laughs> like, yeah. No, my dad, yeah. my dad recorded mostly movies, you know, surprise, surprise off of HBO. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Just back in the day. Yeah. And and he had those like videotapes that could hold like six hours of content. Oh yeah, yeah. So he would record like a bunch of movies on one VHS. <laughs> so you could. I wish I could find those. I I they're in a landfill somewhere. But I was about to say like, he doesn't. Have I wish those. I could get a hold of those because it would be so funny to pop in because you didn't really know what was coming up. <laughs> right. Like you'd be watching like Pee Wee's Big Adventure and then fucking Lust in the Dust would pop up. <laughs> <laughs> fucking ridiculous. Hamburger the movie after that. Um, Hamburger. Yeah, I am. I am rattling off some deep cuts. <laughs> so, sorry, sorry. But anyway, I got hit with nostalgia here. But but what we are working with here is a cool combination of urban legends and a tad of that technophobia, you know, with these videotapes uh, on the technophobia side. It's not as deep as it was in last week's pulse. Right. It's there a little bit on the surface. Like just a touch with right. that whole mysterious videotape thing. But I wouldn't necessarily call this a technophobe movie. Right. Would you? No. No, not really. I, it, it, a little. A little. Like I said, it has that theme there, but it's not It's not nearly as, like, catapulted as you like it was in Pulse. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't, I don't know how you felt about this opening scene. Like, it, did this set it up kind of nice for you? or It set a good pace for the movie of what it was going to be, I guess I should say. Right, right. And we're also dealing with a a combination of classic Japanese horror and modern Japanese uh, like urban legends. Mm -hmm. I, I I like that mix because this is definitely like a kaidan story that's been updated and modernized and stuff like that. And I really right. enjoy that, you know. The the dread gets set up early on because these girls are like laughing and hanging out and stuff and then things get serious, you yes. know, like the phone rings. And then you're just going to tell yeah. my whole next paragraph. <laughs> just shut I'm the fuck so up. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but I like the mood it sets. Right. You know. Yeah. And we're going to get there. And we're going to get Are you there. Are going to let me talk? I'm very excited. I'm sorry. I'm, I just, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Shut the fuck up. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Elvira's 71 or 70. Can you believe that? She said, I wish I looked that good when I was 70 or when I, when I will be 70. <laughs> I was like, um. Wait, no, what? I'm not a immortal vampire. Let's just continue with the movie, please. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so while the girls are laughing, the phone rings and they get freaked out. The one girl, her name is Tomoko. 
Yeah. Tomoko. Tomoko. I was like, I'm saying that wrong. Well, what we probably both are, so it's not <laughs> a big deal. <laughs> um, well, she admits that it wasn't a prank, that she actually did see the video and get a phone call. Uh-huh. So they go to answer the phone, and it's just um, her parents. Right, right. And the other girl leaves the room to use the restroom, and uh, the other girl, uh, she's kind of standing there, and she turns around and this light flashes in her face and then it just goes to the next scene. Yeah. And and we have, it, it's a subtle horror in today's uh, feature. Oh yeah. Um, you have these shifts in tones, which I kind of talked about earlier. Uh, you have it all throughout the movie. We go from laughing to dead serious. Yeah. And, and this one doesn't really give you a break at all. Like it, it's toned throughout that dread that it builds up. It's throughout the whole thing. Unlike Pulse, where it was building up to a crescendo, you get like these little uh, these little payoffs throughout the movie. And I don't want to call them jump scares because right. they're really not. No. But it's just like, boom. It, it just hits you with this like <laughs> gut drop. Right. Like, but it's not a jump scare at all. No. Like it's not like uh, my my definition of a jump scare is if like i slammed a table next to you and it jostled you because you're a human being and that's, <laughs> and that's how you respond to to shock right like but with this one it drops your stomach so it's not so much a jump scare as it is just a plunge into dread right like just a oh god <laughs> <laughs> you know and uh also we don't necessarily see anyone die in this movie that's another thing uh, th- that carries over from Pulse as well, you know. Well, not so much Pulse. Pulse gave us those uh, suicides and stuff. But in this movie, you don't see anyone really die. And honestly, that kind of plays with your imagination. Right. Yeah. Do, I mean, do their hearts explode? Do they die of fright? Does our Anru Sadako, as we, or Sadoko, as we find out later, make them suffer or anything like that? You don't really know. Right. So it makes the deaths a bit more frightening that way, I feel. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Because, like, th- this is one of the biggest differences between the American one and this one. Uh, just one of the biggest differences is that, like, their faces when they die, it's more of like a petrified petrified horror look right, of their right. faces in this movie whereas in the other ones they get warped into a zombie looking fucking monster creature <laughs> and for some reason by the way the intro of that american one <laughs> for some reason when they show her face uh, it, it it cracks me up now i don't know why it cracks <laughs> me up but anyway i think we're obsessed with like as americans we're obsessed with when the body dies we're obsessed with decay uh, yeah, I see what Whereas you mean. Whereas that yeah. doesn't necessarily happen right away. You know what I mean? Like, oh, well, it, yeah. there's some time before that. And so, like, <laughs> and so with this, you know, we're finding dead bodies with just fucking fright boiled into their face. And I think that's tons more terrifying than just finding a zombie. Oh, yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. But anyway, <laughs> I'm going to compare a lot, I feel like, in this episode, because what can you do, you know? Uh, but, like... I don't want people to think I'm hating on the American ring because I know that's some people's favorite movie and stuff like that. I just feel like once you see this movie, (laughs) that won't be your favorite movie. Yeah, it won't be your favorite movie anymore because I just feel like this one does it so much better. And taking that type of ghost out of the Japanese setting. It works because it is Japanese work. Yeah. Like, I don't know how to explain. No, no, totally. And I think what uh, ring, you know, does... uh, fucking masterfully is keep you on your toes yeah you're always at unease in this movie while watching this movie and that's i feel like that's a much better use of fear than just ooh a zombie <laughs> like, because uh samara in the american ring looks like a zombie when she comes out of the thing i mean we get to see yeah. her face at the end and everything yeah anyway so three girls are being interviewed about the video One of them heard that suddenly there's a scary woman on screen that says uh, you will die in one week. And they say she appears when you watch it late, when you watch late night TV shows. Mm -hmm. And then the phone rings and the interviewer asks if anybody has died from it. And one of the girls answers and says that a girl who watched it died in a car on a date with her boyfriend. The interviewer then asks if it was an accident, like a car accident. Yeah, yeah. And she says, no, they were found dead in a parked car. They had vo- both watched the video and it, uh, the article was in the paper a few days ago. Mm-hmm. 
And the interviewer asked what school that girl went to because she was only 17. Yeah, yeah. The, the kids didn't know what school she went to. Yeah. It, did you feel like, okay, one thing that I was getting from like some vibes from this was like uh, the Candyman. Uh, the movie Candyman, I, I just felt like uh, so like the main movies that really influenced these uh, creators on this movie and the novel was Poltergeist uh, and uh, Amityville Haunting. And, you know, those classic haunting movies really influenced them a lot in this. But I feel like this has got some Candyman vibes to it where she's going around interviewing people about an urban legend. Basically, right. Right. Which, uh, I don't know. That's <laughs> I just wanted to sneak <laughs> that in. I didn't know how you were feeling about it. Now that you say that, yeah, yeah, totally just a little sense. bit, just surface vibes. It, it's not Candyman. I'm not saying this <laughs> no. ripped off Candyman or anything like that. No, but it just no. it has those little surface vibes to it. It's that urban legend vibe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. which I love a good urban legend, and I think I think that's another reason why I love this movie so much. Rako, yeah. yeah, is the journalist that did the interview. She's at work now, and a man comes to tell her that ten years ago a star. Like a movie star, yeah, killed herself, and people saw um, her ghost on TV. And Rialco, see, I want to say Rialco. It's because you're trying to pronounce that I. Yeah, Rico. No, <laughs> Rico. Rico Suave. Rico. <laughs> Rico. 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 Uh -huh. That's uh, I'm terrible. <laughs> says that this time everyone has mentioned the. Izu Peninsula. Yeah. They, okay, when the girls are talking about it, they're talking about how the boy had recorded this one. His family was in Izu. Yeah. And then the, the girls that were being interviewed mentioned Izu. Yeah. Basically, they're they're starting to figure out, or she's starting to figure out, Reiku is, she's starting to figure out, like, exactly where the origin of this uh, tape came from right and uh so so just like in pulse i'm not gonna go super deep into the cast uh there are a few mentions of some really good actors in this movie which by the way again <laughs> everybody does a phenomenal job in this fucking movie oh I, yeah <laughs> it's so funny because you always have it like in an american movie you always have the, that one person who's like i don't know what they're doing in this horror <laughs> movie but it seems like all the movies that we've watched so far for for j horror month uh, just the acting is so tight and dead on it's almost scarily perfect but anyway um <laughs> I, but I'm not going to go super deep into the cast because most casual listeners probably have never heard of anything. A lot of these actors have been in, although I will say Nanako Matsushima, who plays a uh, Reiku here, uh, she's known as the queen of Japanese drama in Japan, uh, oh. which is known as J drama. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yes, like J-Horror. You have J-Drama. <laughs> um, uh, but Japanese TV drama is what that is. But again, the cast... I, I do I, like I have no complaints about the acting in this movie because like again with just like in pulse you, you a, a level of like subtlety is required here and, right and right and here's one thing and this is what something something you noticed right off the bat with these movies was there is not a shit ton of dialogue no not really like in every bit of dialogue is important Yes. Like that's another yes. thing. Like it, these movies are not something you could just throw on in the background and, and hope to catch the story. Oh my Jesus. Yeah. No. They require your viewing. <laughs> but <laughs> And I, I wonder if that's why a lot of people get tripped up on these movies. It's, it's very much a ghost story. Yes. Like it's what you want from a ghost story movie. It's dreary. It's, it's spooky. It's a there's, ghost mystery. Yes, there's that mystery and tension. But you can tell a lot of movies that come after this that were influenced by this stuff tend to follow this. Like, I think that's why our ghost story movies have gotten better, you know, over the years. So the man then asks where the story of the woman with the torn lips started. And we talked about that in our one and two of J-Horror. Yeah, the carved woman. Yeah. Yes. She thinks it started in somewhere else. I'm not yeah. Gifu. Gifu. <laughs> I don't know. She says that these stories get started when people die horrible deaths and uh, that they should go to Izu to find out about the story. Yeah. And as she is leaving, she stops and looks at the, a newspaper that says a couple was found dead in a car and she's reading it 
and she realizes something. So then she stops and asks somebody if he can find out where this girl went to high school and to call her when he finds out. Reiku rushes home to get ready with her son, Yochi. Hey, you got that dead on. Because she says it a lot. In this. Yes, Yochi. Yeah. Also, I chose last week and today's feature for a reason, because I know a lot of people are probably like, why did you choose movies that were so like uh, modern, like more modern movies. And I, I chose them because like, I feel like I wanted to get your thought on like the different kind of storytelling aspects that a, a Japanese horror movie does. Cause it was either going to be ring or it was going to be Ju on the grudge. Oh, okay. That I yeah. would show to you, which uh, Ju on the grudge is uh, like a lot of vignettes told around uh, a singular setting. What's, you know a, what I mean? what's a vignette? Different little stories that are interconnected. Yeah, I don't like that. <laughs> yeah, so I, I was thinking that might have been too much. <laughs> you know I don't like that shit. It pisses me off. <laughs> but I thought about because, okay, because last week was definitely a dream-like movie. Yeah. It was like, like we, what did we say? It's like a living nightmare is what we watched last week. And this one is more a traditional, just straight-on narrative. Right, very straight-on. Yeah. Yeah. The feeling that it gave me, I was trying to think of how it made me feel but the feeling it gave me was um that this could be like if they would have told me after i watched this movie that it was based on a true story oh uh, yeah and that true story would be like an urban legend kind uh -huh. of thing i would believe them really yes like yeah, well, because it does very much feel like an urban legend itself. Right. Like the whole movie, like it does very much feel like that. And and I mean, for lack of a better words, that's we're using the you know <laughs> urban legend because that's what we're used to here. Right. But it, it very much feels like that as opposed to just a straight on ghost story movie. Yeah. Because also, I I don't know, maybe that's uh, what the the scenes we're in now really aren't supernatural at all. We're we're in the middle of a uh, investigative journalism. <laughs> Right. Is what we're seeing. So that's kind of how this whole movie made me feel. It was like yeah. it could be true in their in Japanese folklore. Right. Right. And I think <laughs> I think the reason why this one was was one of the first it wasn't by the way, it wasn't the first remake of a Japanese horror movie. But right. It, but it was the one that really took off. And I think it's because of the narrative in today's. I mean, well, you're going to hear it a lot where we're going to say, like, this story is so gripping. Right. Like, it is a damn good story in a movie as opposed to, like, Pulse last week, which is a good movie, but not necessarily a great story. It's just how it's executed. And I think that's why th that remake ultimately just fucking failed. Right. <laughs> Reiku rushes home to get ready with her son, Yochi, to attend Tomoko's funeral. This is the girl from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and this is Reiku's niece. Well, the boy asks how Tomoko died. And Reiku says, uh, just disease. Yeah. And then he asks if kids can die too. And she says, yes, sometimes they do get sick. Hold on a second. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I knew you had something to say, but I have something okay. to say. Okay. Imagine. Okay. If you have not seen this movie, you need to watch it. But this kid's like five. This kid is five. Right. I'm, I'm going to say that. He's maybe six at the most. He's yes. this little tiny boy. What the fuck? He's just home. Well, in he's just home by himself, <laughs> hanging out, waiting for his mom. He very much home. has to take care of himself because he's basically stepped into that like uh, paternal figure role. You know, the father figure. The father's missing, which we'll get to the father here in a little while. We'll discuss him when we get to him. Right. But like, uh, he very much has to step up. So it's almost like this little kid has grown up really quick. But also, the on kid's like six. Yeah. On top of that, he's also clairvoyant. If you didn't pick that up yes. through the movie, you yes. know, he gets that from his father. So he's also clairvoyant. So he's not like other kids as well. So it's, it's this poor fucking kid. Him. This poor right. fucking kid. And then his mom still has him wearing matching fucking pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> and and we'll discuss this as we go, though. But we're really dealing with a uh, a really a challenge against the traditional like gender roles 
in Japan. You know, we're, oh, we're, yeah. we're challenging those in this movie. Oh, yeah. Uh, because, and I'll get to it later, but like it, it, the fact that uh, Reku is a woman in this is a huge change from what it was in the novel, which right. again, I'll discuss that when I get there. <laughs> but, but honestly, on paper, this isn't very scary. You know, yeah, like this isn't necessarily scary. It's a very good story. But uh, I think um, what makes it scary in this movie, because we what, what was the last scary part was at the beginning when Tomoko turns around. That was pretty much our last like frightening part. Right. But the whole time during this, and I, I really wanted to touch on this, was through this whole time, even though we're in investigative journalism land, like <laughs> It's still scary somehow. Right. Like, I don't know if you noticed that. It's still, you're still kind of on uneasy about everything. Yeah, because you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, because everyday things are kind of freaky for some reason in this movie. (laughs) And I think that's because of the use of sound again. You know, a a sound plays a big part in this movie. Uh, You get a real feeling of fear in everything around our characters. You know, Hideo Nakata, like he he amplifies mundane objects. I don't know if you noticed that. Like telephones, they sound different and they're louder than anything that's happening around. It sometimes drowns out the whole action of the thing. Yeah. But like uh, like there's a camera later on. There's a Polaroid camera that, that is loud as shit when he's using it. Uh, Raiju, uh, Rio, uh, we'll talk about that later. Okay. <laughs> but, okay. But there's like camera noises. Oh, I know now. Yeah. I was like, what are you? And talking? even some of the know. ambient noises because there's a rain scene. Oh, that really yeah. hits. Which, by the way, that rain scene. We'll talk about that in a little bit. That hits you right <laughs> in the fucking heart. <laughs> like there, <sighs> are, you guys. There's a scene in this fucking movie that has no words, but it tells you more than you <laughs> you needed <laughs> that it ever could with the script. But anyway. But it works. These sounds work to build the tension when there is no dialogue and when there's no horror. You know, we're still carrying across this horror feeling throughout the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And it it, it strikes me as insane because Nakata, um, he he doesn't consider himself a horror director. He considers himself more of a a film director. He's just, he, he makes movies. And if he has to make a scary movie, he makes it scary. That's what he said in the interviews. And I'm like, Jesus, yeah, (laughs) like like that's really crazy. So, but it it just feels like he's mastered it in this movie. And this is like one of his biggest first, like, uh, horror movies. Uh, the one that came before that really got him the directing job on this and got him noticed by Suzuki who wrote the novel was a movie called a, what was it? It's ghost something. And it's a, it's an old ghost story movie, which again, it's one of those that hasn't been released outside of Japan. (laughs) But so he had, he had done this before and it really got him noticed. But I like, again, the sound uh, going back to that telephone, like at the very beginning of the film, I don't know if you notice that it has a different, it has a distinct sound. That's not like a normal movie telephone. Well, I don't know about that, but I guess I didn't notice that. But I did notice the loudness. Yes, yes. Uh, it will like they uh, Nakata tried. He wanted to avoid the traditional Hollywood sound of a telephone because if you well, okay, nobody's like me. Um, <laughs> if you watch a lot of movies, you notice that they kind of reuse the same sound effect for a telephone ringing. Oh, uh, they use that quite a bit. Well, this one they combine several different tones. Just to avoid that sound. So you get a very distinct ring oh, okay. to, in this movie. <laughs> ring. <laughs> Sorry. So I don't know. I, I guess I mentioned this stuff because of how much care was taken to set the mood in this thing throughout. Right. You know, right. that's just a little thing. Who would who would have fucking sat there and been like, we got to make this telephone ring sound different. Like <laughs> Nobody would have done that. You just would have used the regular telephone ring. Right. But like uh, here he uses, uh, like I said, he shapes this world that we're in, which again, I'm comparing the pulse, which I really shouldn't. Because there are two separate different movies, but like I feel like in this movie, as opposed to Pulse, which Pulse had a very d- dilapidating, on the brink of collapse, like uninhabited world that right. we were in there. Right. This one has an inhabited world, but it very much feels claustrophobic to me. Oh, yeah. I see what you mean. Yeah. Yes, it, it's very closed off. Yeah, it's very closed off. And and it seems like it gets smaller as we go. 
Reiko goes to speak with um, her sister, uh, Tomoko's mom. And uh, she asks Tomoko's mom if anybody knows how Tomoko died. And Reiko says that no one knows. And her mom says, or her sister, sorry, the police did an autopsy, but there there wasn't a crime. Yeah. And uh, the sister says the uh, that people don't just die like that. They never open the coffin, and this is really strange. Reiko gets a call, and the kid that died in the car also went to the same school as Tomoko. So she knows that this is kind of connected. Yeah. Um, she then goes to talk to some of the girls that are at the funeral, and she asks them if the girl in the car was their friend, too. And they say that all of them died on the same day, and there's another girl that had a motorcycle accident. And they had all seen the weird video. They also say that the girl that was with Tomoka the night that she died went crazy and has been in the mental institution. Yes. And the the one the young woman who plays Tomoko in the film, by the way, uh, Yuko Takeuchi, uh, she was once called an Ameri- by an American filmmaker, by the way, as Japan's answer to Aubrey Hepburn. Um, oh. Yeah, she was actually a really good actress. Uh, she was in a, I believe it was an HBO show where she played a, a female version of uh, Sherlock Holmes. Uh, oh, Miss Holmes, cool. yeah, uh, it's pretty cool. Um, but that that was after I believe she starred in the film in the show, TV show Flash Forward here in the states. She had a role in that, and uh, that's when the American filmmaker said that about Aubrey Hepburn. But she was also nominated for an award, or like a bunch of awards, and even won Best Supporting Actress at the Japanese Academy Awards. Wow. Yeah. Um, sadly, uh, she was found hung in her home in Shibuya, Tokyo, at the age of four, forty in twenty twenty. Uh, yeah, no suicide note, though. So they're just saying she was hung. They didn't say it was a suicide? No, they don't know. They just found her like that. It, But it comes on the tail end of, like, in 2020, quite a few uh, Japanese actors uh, committed suicide, which is really strange. <laughs> but, but I mean, it goes, I don't know, it goes back to that, you know, we talked about suicide all this month, I feel. I wonder... And I know this is really sad, but I just thought about this. I wonder if they got a lot of pushback because people kept calling it the China virus. And I know they're Japanese, Uh but white people don't see that. It could have been. Yeah, because I mean, you know, a a rash of like Asian, like racist crimes started happening here in the States. I I know of, you know, like we had a huge outbreak of that. Right. So maybe and maybe combined with the. The fucking pandemic, you know, right. that, that played heavy on a lot of people's uh, psyche. So who right. knows the combination? But I thought it was, in, in, you know, worth in mentioning uh, that she passed away and that she was actually a very good actress. And I, I think she she does a good job in here. This was her first role. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So Reiko is at work reviewing the footage from the kids in the car. And a man tells her that the cause of death was uh, their hearts just stopped, but no drugs. They didn't overdose. It, it's it, ooh. <laughs> And we get this little clip because they're talking about it or whatever. They're re- reviewing the tape. And we see Tomoko's, no, not Tomoko's face. Uh, we see the girl's face. And it's like. It's petrified fear. Petrified. That's a good yeah, word. Yeah. It's like scared to death. I guess is really what you say. Right. And for some reason that scares that scares the shit out of me that we cuz it's it's that's real. Like you can be frightened to death. Right. Like it's it has to do with something about serotonin or whatever shot to your heart and stuff and uh, Right. So it, it, it's a, it's a big thing you can read about it. I'm not going to go into it cuz I don't know but but that kind of freaks me out like that you can be frightened to death. Like I've always wondered like what it would take to scare me to death. Like <laughs> Right. I'd have to I don't know. For you it'd have to be a lot I feel like. Yeah, like a republic breaks into our house. <laughs> oh my god, stop. <laughs> Anyway, this movie also deals with the same things that we dealt dealt that we dealt with in Pulse, uh-huh. where um, there's no timeline. I mean, there is later on. There's a timeline, um, 
but there's no blending of the scenes. Like you're in one scene and then you go to the next. Yeah, there's scene. not a shitload of uh, establishing scenes. Establishing um, scenes. There, That's what I mean. There is some, but not as not as many. I, I I don't know. Again, just like in Pulse, like it doesn't bother me here. Like oh, it doesn't bother me. Yeah, either. it. I don't know what it is. I think it's because of the way they set it up i don't know right but i just don't want people to be like oh she just jumped no 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 we're not jumping around we're <laughs> this is exactly <laughs> how yeah. it fucking went yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so reiko goes to look through tomoko's room and she finds a receipt for a photo development place which i don't know a fucking kinko's whatever <laughs> <laughs> so Tomoko's mom comes in and says that this is where she found her daughter dead. Then we get a shot of Tomo oh. Tomoko all twisted and looking like she got scared to death. Yeah, like which again, about. it's not it's not like what you're thinking. It's not a uh, like a zombie looking dead body. It's just someone who's been frightened to death, which is and her body's all distorted, like twisted. Yeah, which is much more frightening. Yes. Like I feel like it's oh, much yeah. more frightening than like you know pale eyes and. Uh, gray skin and looks like she's been in water too long. Yeah, that uh, no joke. That's what they do in the American version, <laughs> and it bothers me to this day. But anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, but it's a pretty good. I, I I like I said. I don't want to call it jump scare, but it does get you. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. Because this scene just pops out of nowhere. <laughs> and we did not expect that. Yes, yes. And uh, I I don't know. I like. How do you feel about this movie's scares? I think they're fine. Like each one of them, I feel like has a buildup. Right. It does. And I mean, you don't expect what you see. No. Which is a, not a jump scare, but. Yeah. Again, but it's also, not a jump scare. It's not like the scene does kind of come out of nowhere, but also at the same time, it's not like bam or anything right. like that. It's just like. <laughs> There's no loud noise to go with it. Yeah. No. Because. And I think if, if this was uh, Americanized, it someone would be screaming. Right, right. You know what I mean? Like, or there'd be a Or loud you'd have those, those build up of a, uh, and we talked about this last time, the build up with the strings yeah, that we do in yeah. horror movies. That <laughs> <laughs> yes. We don't get that here. And I think that's what makes this, uh, these Japanese horror movies much more unpredictable than what we get over in the States, you know? Right, right. So Reiko goes um, and gets the pictures developed that uh, she found the receipt for. Oh. And she sees pictures of these four kids all hanging out at this cabin that they stayed at the night that they watched the video. And and one of their pictures, um, all of their faces are like, I put distorted, but really yeah. they're like blurred. Yeah, they're kind of like blurred out. Yeah. And their faces are, they're a little distorted, I guess. But um. Now, I feel like this is something we kind of took to the extreme here in the States. I don't know if you noticed this, but after the J-horror boom hit, uh, we were warping people's faces anytime we could get a hold <laughs> of it in movies. And it was like the shittiest CGI. And like going back and watching those movies nowadays, it's kind of like, damn, I really wish you wouldn't have done that. Because <laughs> <Right. laughs> that was like a thing there for a while where like someone would turn to the camera and their face would go. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's an audio medium, so I'm having a hard time explaining to it. Just... <laughs> now you guys are going to watch one of those, two, you know, early 2000s movies. <laughs> You're going to hear my voice when someone's face changes. <laughs> <laughs> But but no, we, we got stuck on that, you know, and we just thought that was the fucking scariest thing ever for some <laughs> reason. But uh, Hiroshi Takahashi, who uh, co-wrote the script, came up uh, with this uh, this picture stuff, you know, like uh, how like when you hit you get hit by this curse. I mean, let's go ahead and call it that uh, your face in photos starts twisting and stuff like that. And uh, it, that's actually it's called uh, Shirai uh, Shashin. Uh, and it's the appearance of ghosts and spirits in photos, you know, like uh, oh. fucked up photos. It's apparently pretty popular phenomenon in Japan, you know, kind of like our orbs and stuff here in America. That's we have ghost thinking. photos here in America a lot. <laughs> right. And oh, my God, I hate when I watch a video like on Facebook or TikTok or something and they're like, there's an orb in that. I'm like, it's a ghost. It's like a bug on the fucking Right. I'm like, no. It's like, you know, cameras pick up dust too, right? <laughs> <laughs> so Yochi tells 
Reiku that Tomoko saw the forbidden video. And Reiko freaks out and tells him not to speak about it at school. Reiko then goes to the cabin that Tomoko and her friends were at. And she tries to find the tape and she can't. She th- then goes to talk with the um, the workers or the owners of the cabin and asks him if anything was weird with the kids. And as she's waiting, she sees the videotape um, on the wall, I said, but it's like on a shelf, whatever. Yeah, it's like uh, this cabin has a, a video rental thing, which. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you remember when hotels would do that? No. You don't? Okay, so we <laughs> stayed in a lot of hotels when I was younger. And they literally would have, you could rent out a, VC, a VCR and you could rent a uh, rent videotapes at the front desk. So you could like rent movies and stuff like that before. This was before pay per view and stuff like <laughs> right, that was right. available in all hotels. Because not all hotels had the, the, the rental screen, you know, like we do now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I just, I, again, the nostalgia hits you in the fucking head with this movie. <laughs> <laughs> right. So she takes the tape and she goes to watch it in the cabin. Right. And one thing that's that differs greatly about the formula Hideo Nakata has here from the American, well, any American horror movies is is the length between scares. You have a good amount of time before we get to some real horror. Right. Like, like I said, you know, we got we got that little pop scare earlier. I, again, I don't know. I don't know what else to call it, <laughs> but we got that. But you're you're looking at like. You know, from there to that point, you have 30 minutes of screen time before you get to the next scare. And then you have like a a little bit of time built up before you get to this scare, which isn't even as scary, but it still is. It's more (laughs) of that dreaded fear thing going on in you. Right. And, you know, which it, it only really pays off. Like all the scares in this movie only really pay off because of the atmosphere that we talked about earlier. You know, how how Nakata set up this really creepy, thick, dense atmosphere, which I would say the only movie to really get this right, this kind of atmosphere, is probably The Fog. Did I see that movie? Yeah. Uh, John Carpenter's The Fog. It was an early episode of ours with uh, Jamie oh, Lee Curtis. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. because like you don't have a lot of horror going on and, and there's big lengths of time when you're learning the mystery and stuff like that of what's going on. And it really does this movie and that movie and there's several other movies, you know, I'm not just saying those are the only two that does it. Right. But like that movie and this movie like really get that ghost story vibe going because right. it feels like the the feeling that you have with this movie it feels like someone's telling you a ghost story around a fire right like and it's not like uh, it's not boring in between the scares no no that's another thing that's another yeah. thing that kind of like keeps this going is because in between the scares and around the horror you have a good story right you know i agree yeah So on the tape, there's a woman brushing her hair, and she's looking into a mirror. She sees something behind her, but then when she looks behind her, it's gone. Then there are words floating all over the screen, and the word word is eruption. Mm -hmm. And then we see people, like, crawling around on the ground, and then it looks like... Or then it's a person pointing and they have a towel over their head. Mm-hmm. And then we see a well in the forest and then the tape cuts. Then the phone rings. <laughs> so Reiku answers and it's got this weird music playing. So she just hangs up. Yeah. And she says one week and grabs her things and runs out. Yeah. So now the time clock is going, which... Yes, yeah, she adds, looks at the clock yeah. and it's a little after t- seven. It it adds some extra attention to this movie that like yeah. possibly, you know. <laughs> She's like, oh, fuck. Yeah. Uh, now, the video editor who put this video together of uh, the, the, well, the ring video. <laughs> oh, OK. I was yeah. like, what? <laughs> uh, he used a process that he wouldn't tell anybody about, I guess, because he wanted to like keep his editing secrets to himself but <laughs> uh, you know he didn't even tell Nakata about it but but they did shoot this thing on 35 millimeter and uh, when they took it to the guy he he did something to it to where he makes it look like old and yeah re- but but it's not like when you watch this thing it's not like it it's you can't tell it's faked <laughs> you know what I mean 
<laughs> like I think it looks it looks genuine with the tracking and stuff like that. It's oh, only yeah, something yeah. you could do with VHS tapes, which is why I don't like so with the American Rings they brought it into the later 2000s with a third movie, Rings. Ugh. I don't know if you even saw that one. But it like uh in that third Ring movie which was called Rings, it it went digital. Oh, okay. Yeah, it wasn't a videotape anymore. And I don't know. Seeing that kind of video digitally, it's kind of goofy. That sounds like it would yeah, be. Yeah, yeah. But but anyway, but I really like how this thing looks. And it adds an extra creepy layer to this movie. Right. When you right. see this fucking creepy haunted videotape, <laughs> which sounds silly, but <laughs> it's very creepy. But um, like I said, uh, all the scenes in this videotape refer to Sudoku. Um. A, a few of them are made more clear in the sequel as well. So if you're kind of like, what the fuck does that mean? Don't worry. You, just, you don't have to worry too much. <laughs> they do explain the ones that matter in this movie as we go later on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so the next day, Ray, Reiku's ex-husband comes because she has called him. Uh -huh. His name is Ryuji. Ryuji. Yep. I don't. Yeah, you nailed it. I don't know about them. <laughs> well, he is a teacher at a university and she called to talk to him about the tape and tells him that four people died on the same day after watching it. Uh -huh. And he tells her to get exercised. <laughs> I don't think that was supposed to be funny, but it came very funny to me. Like it came up like telling her she needs an exorcism yeah. was just hilarious. <laughs> so she then wants him to take her picture. So he does. When the Polaroid comes out, her face is distorted. And Ryuji watches the tape and then they wait for the phone to ring. And it doesn't. Yeah. So he wants her to make a copy of the tape for him. He says that she can't be sure that she is going to die because this is a videotape and someone had just made it like it's just a tape like yeah yeah you can't prove anything so reiku is at work and she is analyzing the tape really close and she sees in the last clip mm -hmm. that the well scene it looks like someone is crawling out before it cuts off yeah you see the hand in the top of the head come up yeah which again that's creepy as fuck man <laughs> Yes, <laughs> and you miss it. Like if yeah. you watch the thing like in real time, yeah, you're it's a missing blink of the it. Eye. Yeah, yeah. And then her coworker comes up and brings her a list from the cabin registry. Right, right. Uh, which, which Ryuji is a very interesting character in this movie, but uh, he's a very interesting character because he's an absentee father, which is very interesting, and we get no explanation, like of his backstory, why they're split up or why anything. We get we get none of that, right? Like which is it, it, again, it's just more little layers to this story. But anyway, that scene in the rain where he he sees Taguchi uh, before he goes outside, inside, you know, before he goes yeah. inside, and they just kind of look at each other. That's what I meant by it's a scene that really fucking just says everything. <laughs> like yeah. it says everything about his relationship with his ex wife and his his son. Right. Which is very interesting to me. He must have done something dishonorable. Maybe. Like, I mean, you don't know. You, you never really find out about that. Right. Um, now, and by the way, it's been years since I've seen the sequel. So, <laughs> and I'll explain. There's two sequels to this movie. So it's all confusing. But anyway. Um, <laughs> so if Ryuji looks familiar to any of you, that's for good reason. He's played by Hiroyuki Sonata. Now, Sonata made his film debut when he was five in... In Game of Chance, a Sonny Chiba film. Uh, if you guys, uh, I am a Sonny Chiba fan. So, <laughs> so okay. uh, very awesome movies, by the way. Uh, in fact, he joined the J uh, the Japan Action Club at age twelve, which was organized by Sonny Chiba. But yeah, some uh, so, some of you might have seen him in uh, 2013's The Wolverine. Where, where he played uh, Shinjin and had a pretty fucking awesome fight with Hugh Jackman's Wolverine character. <laughs> I was going to say, is yeah. that one of the Wolver or the one, bleh, the Hugh Jackman movies? Is that one of the Wolverines? <laughs> That's not what I meant. 
I know I'm an old lady. <laughs> but also recently in 2021, Hiryu Yoko or Yuki uh, played Hanzo Hasashi, better known as Scorpion in Mortal Kombat, the new Mortal Kombat movie. Oh, that. cool. Yeah, so, it, so if he looks familiar, that's where he's from. Which, I, by the way, if again, I'm not going to go into the list of movies <laughs> he's in because he's he's kind of one of my favorite actors. Uh, but Hira Yuki uh, Sanada, he he is a really good fucking actor in a lot of action movies too. Uh, so just kind of like seek out some movies he's in and uh, check that out. Okay, okay, the Wolverine. <laughs> the Wolverine. <laughs> so Ryoji is sitting on a park bench, and someone walks up to him. We only see the feet. Uh-huh. And in his mind, he asks her, was it you? Did you do this? But then he looks up and no one is there. Reiko meets Ryuji at his apartment and she brings a copy of the of the tape. Yeah. So they sit down and watch it together this time. And as they're analyzing the tape, someone comes to the door. It's one of Ryuji's students. So Ryuji and Reiko leave to go to Reiko's uh, work where they can they can be alone. They won't be interrupted or whatever. Right. Because they don't want to expose anybody else to this. Well, day. yeah, obviously, just in case. <laughs> and by the way, is he dating his student? Because isn't this his girlfriend? Okay, in the... Everything that I saw, this uh-huh. was just his student. Oh, okay. Well, I, yeah. I'm sorry. I was confused. <laughs> but <laughs> No, everything I saw was just student. Oh, okay, okay. She even, I think her name in there is student. Oh, okay. My bad. Yeah. Okay. I I assumed it was his girlfriend for some reason. I had a different reading on the relationship between the two. I don't know. Maybe that's what caused him to split up with his wife. Oh. Man, we're digging too deep into (laughs) reading. (laughs) Too deep. (laughs) So Ryuji says that whoever made this tape wanted to be found. And he hears that it says frolic in brine goblins be thine yeah which is what's kind of being said yeah it's like it's kind of like a, a fable kind of warning of monsters and ghosts and stuff like that which is really i don't know why that line creeps me the fuck out but it does <laughs> but also i i like how they treat ryuji and uh well T- taguchi as well um wait <laughs> Well, I'm getting oh I got pulse in this movie mixed like, up. Taguchi was last week. Um, <laughs> this his son, his son, Yochi, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, anyway, <laughs> I like how they treat Ryuji and his son with the clairvoyancy. They don't make such a big deal about it in the movie. It's right. just it, and they really don't explain it to you. You just no. pick up on it, which again is something. It, it, well, it explains because you don't like movies that don't hold your hand. Like, well, I kind of like to be led. Yeah, you kind of like to be led. You like simple stories, which is fine. You know, <laughs> right? nothing against that. That's just a casual viewer. That's that's perfectly valid. But like, I feel like this doesn't hold your hand. But at the same time, you're getting it. Can like, I be honest you, about you, that? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. OK, let me be honest about okay. that. The thing okay. is, I had a lot of help with this one. Oh, did you? Because somebody really liked this fucking movie and they put a whole like okay i typed all of this out Uh uh-huh i really didn't need to because they typed it all out for me well yeah what you'll find with these movies (laughs) is that because there is a lot more people like me who are really into these movies especially this one and so these have whole fan sites dedicated to this this very movie so yeah. so you didn't like with your first viewing because you always watch these first yeah. like just dead on watch them without notes and stuff uh what did you pick up that he's clairvoyant especially with that scene in the park where he sees uh what looks like it might be S- sadaku um maybe like a surrogate or something like yeah that. um i was a little confused but he does flat out say it Later on in the movie. Yeah, yeah. I, he does full on say it later. But like, I feel like he, they don't spend so much time on no, that no, as no. they would in a movie like what we would have here. You know, I feel like they would have had us. They would have had a whole scene that said like her calling him and saying, hey, I found this tape. I needed you to look at it and tell me 
what the fuck's going on because you can see ghosts or whatever. Right. And, and we would have made it so fucking cheesy. Yeah. We always make clairvoyance and psychics so fucking <laughs> cheesy in our movies. I mean, think about poltergeist, poltergeist, not poultry geist, <laughs> poltergeist. Uh, think about poltergeist. I just feel like I know everybody loves that movie. I love that movie too, but you got to admit the psychic in that Zelda Rubenstein's character is very cheesy. <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? We yes. always make these people like these otherworldly kind of smarter than everybody type characters when we make psychics and clairvoyance and our movies but in this one you know ryuji is just he's he's just a person that has a, a gift a slight gift like it's not even out of the ordinary you really right uh and it's treated like a normal thing by the way like i don't know if you picked up on that like this is treated like just you know, some people might be psychics. Fuck it. Like, right, <laughs> like right. I like how it's treated too, but like, he's just a normal guy. He has his own problems. He, he has a, he has a thick backstory that you kind of want to explore because he's. Yeah. There's a lot. Yeah. To you him. can tell he's very tortured. Right. Like about this, like whatever he did to split this family up. You know, must have been bad or something. Who knows? Well, we never know. But like, <laughs> I just find him a very fucking interesting character. Yeah. So the next day, Ryuji calls Reiko and tells her that what he heard was a dialect about Brian and goblins, a dialect from Oshima Island, where um, there's a volcano called Mount... Miharayama. <laughs> There's a lot of A's in this, okay? It's a volcano. There's a volcano. It's a volcano. <laughs> so they meet up and start do doing research and find an article from a long time ago about how a woman predicted the eruption before it happened. Mm -hmm. Ryuji set, wants uh, the number for the Oshima Bureau and Reiku wants to know why wants to know why and he said because um she only has four days left yeah so which, we're three days again, into this yeah, ticking clock man i don't know did, did the ticking <laughs> clock part of this movie like did that create more tension yes for you? it did yeah yes it did because every day so the only telling timelines in this is every new day mm -hmm. it says whatever date it was yeah so you're getting I'm like yeah <gasps> you're getting a a countdown basically yeah so in the original novel by the way the the main character is male you know it's not a female and i think changing it to female was a great decision because first of all like in the novel our protagonist was a married man with an infant daughter and a wife you know uh okay. and ryuji in the book he's this unlikable self-proclaimed rapist who hates what? women yeah, what? by the way, in the book. <laughs> right, right. And, and they very fortunately changed Sadaku from an intersex rape victim into what we get here. Yeah. Like, oh, that's weird. <laughs> yes, completely different. And by the way, uh, I, I don't, I've never read the book, you guys. Like, I'll tell you that because I don't know if it's been translated to English. Okay. So, so that's an issue for me. So I don't know if it's been translated to English. May have. Drop me a line if you know where I can get it. Because <laughs> I would love to read the original novel. Right. Uh, but luckily, we get the characters we do. Because I think it adds more layers to this. And maybe it would have added more layers to the other thing. But the problem with it being... Uh, a guy, I think, in the novel and a and problem with it being the, a guy in this movie is I don't think we'd get those like – well, the challenging of the gender roles. Again, like I said, you know, a uh, challenging of uh, – because Reiku very much is dealing with not only a fucking killer ghost tape. <laughs> she's also <laughs> dealing with juggling her career, uh, being a single mother. Uh, you know, she's also, she's having to reach out help to this, uh, father that's very absentee <laughs> and, right. and, and also she's not reaching out for help for her life situation. She's reaching out for help for the ghost tape. So, so you also have that, you know, and I think it, there's a lot put on Reiku in this movie. Yes. And yes. I, I don't think it would have had the same kind of like oomph if it was a man. You know, it would have just been your normal thing. Yeah, because in life, men aren't responsible for anything. <laughs> <sighs> oh, shit. Oh, shit. But <laughs> I mean, responsible for making money. But then if 
never mind. Okay, that's a whole rant that I <laughs> will <laughs> we'll have this rant on uh, shooting the shit. There you go. Next we'll go week. into a rant shooting the shit. But but you know uh, the characters in Ring uh, they go against those gender stereotypes that that kind of I don't want to say plague, but kind of like were a staple of uh, Japan culture. You know, right? Um, and I really liked that they kind of did that. Yeah, they play against those types. Right. Because as we saw, well, no, we didn't really see any of that shit in Pulse. I'm like, what am I talking about? <laughs> no. Um, but like, you know, you can see that in movies that came out before, like in the 80s and stuff like that tradition. You see a lot of tradition. But with this movie, they play with that tradition. We combine new and old, uh, traditional and modern in this movie. Right. We combine that to a huge amount to the point where you even noticed it. Yes. You know? And I'll explain that when it comes yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, so you get a lot of that play. And like I said, I think this it makes this movie feel smarter than it might have been. So Reiko takes Yochi to her dad's house so mm-hmm. they can go all go fishing. Later that night, Ryuji calls Reiko and tells her that the correspondent told him that the woman who predicted the eruption is probably the one in the video. The one brushing her hair. Yeah. Um, she threw herself in the volcano 40 years ago. He says he will go to uh, Oshima tomorrow. And Reiko freaks out and says she only has three days left. And um, he only has four. But um, he says that he'll call her later. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck how many days I'm going. <laughs> because from my understanding, and we'll get into that, but... Mm-hmm. um. This Oshima, it's further away than right, just right. like an hour. Right. Yeah. Um, Reiko gets woken up in the middle of the night by someone saying, Auntie. She looks over and her, at first she thinks someone is there, but they aren't. And then she looks for Yochi because he's gone. Okay, before I get into the next part. Okay. This is where I saw the um, traditional versus non-traditional Japanese. Okay, so at her house... Um, they have beds. Yeah, like like Americans do, like a bed on a frame yeah. and all that. Yeah, Reiko's living and the way she is is very much non traditional. Right, it's, it's very, very modern. modern. Yeah, yeah. But her dad's house, there's no furniture. You there's like a the thin mattress on the floor, and that's where you sleep. And even so, right before this. When she gets the call from right before the phone uh-huh. call or whatever, you see Yochi sleeping on the floor. He fell asleep in front of the television, mm-hmm. but there's no chairs. Right, right. It's very, it's very much a traditional house, and I think Ryuji's house is kind of like that as well, isn't it? No, they have a table and everything. Yeah, he's got a table and a couch or whatever. Yeah, it's um, but I was gonna say I didn't really notice it in Pulse until like it wasn't really like standing out in my brain in pulse until i watched this movie but um (laughs) (laughs) but if you notice in the guy's apartment his bed is not on a frame or or a box spring it's just a mattress on the floor yeah and very much both of these movies really are really it's looking at the way japan is kind of dealing with dropping those traditional kind of look, right. look of life and stuff right. like that and, and adapting to a more modern society. And mm-hmm. so I think like in this movie, especially because you're dealing with, like I said, you're dealing with a classic Japanese ghost story. So you you are dealing with a more modernized version of that. Mm-hmm. And I think it's reflective in the way the settings and the characters act and stuff because Reiko, 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 fuck. (laughs) (laughs) Even, even I got fucked up, but Reiko, she, she even has to deal with that. Like very much as a character, she's dealing with her, her perception. Well, her people's perception of her as a single mother and stuff like that. I I don't know if anybody's catching on to that again, opinions, but like she's having to deal with that, you know, Man, this poor woman. Yeah, t- typically <laughs> uh, she wouldn't be the head of the household and stuff like that. Her right. son wouldn't be helping her out because we do see that. He helps yes. her out. He steps up in that male fi- role figure, you know. Kind of. Kind of yeah. a little bit. But like it's it's very much a challenge, you know, Ugh. for that. And, yeah. and the whole story itself, like I said, being a modernized 
traditional ghost story. <laughs> <laughs> the story itself reflects that. And I, I think that, that very much, I, I don't know for sure, but I feel like that's the mindset we were looking at in 1998. You know, uh, a society that's moving away from the traditional and going more modern. Right. Right. So she's looking for Yochi because he's gone. She opens the door and he's watching the tape. Which again, not scary when we say it, but this oh, shit gets you. Because you know, yeah. like, you're like, oh, like, oh fuck. <laughs> so she starts freaking out and he says that Tomoko told him to watch it. Uh-huh. And this is where you realize that he is clairvoyant also. Yes. Raiji and Reiko are on a boat headed for Oshima. He says that he felt something when he came to her apartment and he thought it was just the tape. Mm-hmm. And she says it was Tomoko. He says um, she is not Tomoko anymore. And she asked if uh, Yochi it, can see her too. And Ryuji just kind of nods at her. Mm-hmm. It's a, They're talking about it, but not talking about right, it. Right, right, right. Um, she says it's all her fault and that she should have ended with Tomoko and her friends. It should have ended with Tomoko and her friends, uh, like the tape or whatever. Uh-huh. And she wants to know where this came from. Ryoji says that nobody starts these kinds of stories. Whatever people feel anxious about becomes rumor and starts to spread or people start them hoping things will turn out like this. Kind of like you said about Candyman. Yes, exactly. Like this is all an urban legend. Right. You know, this is how urban legends take off. You know, right. people get it going. It it doesn't matter. Basically, like what Ray, Ryoji is saying is like it, it doesn't matter where it came from. Mm-hmm. It's going to persist. It's going to keep going because people are going to keep talking about it. Right. Like if it had stopped with Tomoko and her friends, it probably would have kept going because people would have made up more stories about it. And people would have went like her would have went and seeking it. And I think that's how S- Sadako as well i'm saying her name ahead of time right. but we find out the the main villain sadako that's how i think she spreads this throughout is she works with that urban legend kind of mythos right stuff. right oh and, and i like also i don't know if you notice this but there isn't a huge cinematic score in this movie right. kind of like pulse uh, kind of like Pulse did, but uh, it, there is a few haunting atmospheric elements tossed in for effect. But but I like how there's not a lot of music. Yeah, because that's another thing I think that helps set up the mood and helps with these scares and helps you stay in this. I don't know, man. It's just like last week when we talked about how you are constantly in a, a state of waiting for a jump scare. Yeah. Uh. For, you know, because I, I can't come up with better words for it, but that, that's how it feels throughout this entire movie. And you never quite get that jump scare, you know, payoff, you know, but it, you don't need it. Either. But you don't need it. And I think that's where why this movie is so creepy and it gets under your skin a little bit, you know? Yeah. So they get off the boat and meet with a man named Mr. Hayatsu. He is driving them and tells them that the woman from the tape, her name is... Ooh, I'm going to fuck this up. Shizuko? Yeah. Shizuko? Shizuko. Um, well, her cousin is still alive, and he owns this inn that they're going to go to, and they're going to stay there. Mm-hmm. Reiko wants to know why she committed suicide, and Ryuji says because she went insane. The papers had written awful things about her. She became famous all over uh, the island after her prediction of the eruption. She had strange powers all her life, and she was what they call a seer, which I would, I don't know what that means. I meant to look Uh, that up. It's like a clairvoyant or a psychic. I guess You know, a seer. So after that, a professor showed up. He brought Shizuko to Tokyo and experimented on her. He was trying to prove the existence of ESP. The papers praised him, and... Then uh, trashed him. It was 40 years ago and the media still does the same thing. They say that the professor ran away after the university fired him and that Shizoku had a daughter. Uh, what, what I really think is interesting is how Hideo Nakata 
uh, how he takes the age old story of Yatsuo Kaiden, which we talked about in our two part miniseries, our, our first part. Uh, go back and listen to that. Uh, remember how uh, the, the woman gets acid thrown on her face and stuff like that. And he kills his bride and she comes back to haunt him and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's that which is the age old thing. And, and Kabuki theater also played a huge part on this, oh. uh, this movie, especially with how our Onru uh, Sudoku looks at the end of this film. Uh, but, um, mm. uh, but you know, the age old Yatsuo Kaidan really influenced this adaptation of the ring novel. And in the novel, the story is more of a science fiction type of horror, uh, not so much supernatural. It's, it's more, it, it more leans heavily into the ESP and the psychic abilities and all that stuff instead right. of the ghost, you know, because oh, okay. in this movie, it's very much, uh, supernatural. <laughs> yeah. It's very much supernatural and all that just kind of goes away, which I don't know if you picked up on this, but basically like her ESP and her psychic abilities go with her in death. Right. <laughs> which right. is scary. You know, uh, yeah. like what if somebody has those mind powers, killing them doesn't necessarily do anything. It just makes them more powerful. I guess so, sounds yeah. like I'm talking about a Jedi, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> But but I I don't know I I like how uh how he treats this this story here I like how everything is kind of subtle I don't know how to explain it like they don't have to be in your face for you to understand they don't have to hold your hand right right and I know that sounds weird because you know I like movies that hold my hand we already talked about that but it's not needed so they get to the end as they're walking around. They see a mi the mirror from the video. Uh -huh. Raikou freaks out and wants to know um, everything that they know. And the cousin says that, um, oh, and she wants to know about the daughter that Shizoku had. And the cousin says that she didn't have a daughter and just walks off because he's mad. He don't want to talk about this. Right, right. And later... Ryoji goes to talk to Reiko and she begs him to find a way to save Yochi. He says that maybe they all three should die and they shouldn't have had a kid in the first place, <laughs> which I didn't understand that. <laughs> like, what did that have to do? Why? I don't know. Man. That guy lashed out out of nowhere, though. Yeah, he was just like, <laughs> maybe y'all should all fucking die. Yeah. huh? He was just basically like, fuck this. Fuck that. Like, fuck all right, life. negative Nancy shit. <laughs> right. So then a woman comes in the room and she gives them um, all that is left of Shizoku. And it's a picture of her and the professor. Yeah. Boom, boom, boom. Ba -ba -bum. So the next day. Reiji goes to talk to the cousin again and the cousin tells them that he'd better leave this town because there's a storm coming tonight and Ryoji wants to know what Shizuka was like he says that she was a she was a strange one she used to come out and sit by the sea and all day long she just stared at the sea every single day and all the fishermen hated her I didn't understand that. If she's just staring at the sea, why are the fishermen mad at her? Stop looking at the sea. I guess. I was just we like, don't what? take kindly to people looking out on the sea. <laughs> Especially women. <laughs> the women folk looking at the sea. It pisses us off. I know. I was like, why did they get mad at I don't know. Quit looking at me. <laughs> I, I, I wonder. Snorted. I wonder if she was like yelling and like scaring the. Fish. She was yelling at the fisherman. You no, think like, she's sitting out there like, like scaring the fish. I don't know. <laughs> Hello, water. <laughs> Hi. The <Ooh>. crazy. <laughs> anyway, anyway. Hey, the crazy bitches out there yelling at the sea again. <laughs> oh my god! Stop. She's scaring the fish away. Arr, why arr, do they arr, arr. why do they have those accents? I don't know why they sound like pirates. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I, I, I think I just offended women and fishermen. <laughs> so, <laughs> I will take my leave. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> She's yelling at the sea. I don't oh, sorry. know. You got me with that one. You got me with that one. Okay. So <laughs> Raiji asked if uh if she could read people's minds. And she must have known about things uh, which people hid deep inside their minds that must have been painful. 
and the man tells him to go home. He then tells the man that he he has similar abilities. Ryuji tells the cousin that he's one of the ones that spread rumors about her abilities and that he also called um, the professor. That, okay, this whole scene was very confusing because they were talking very quickly. <laughs> I'm going to tell you that. There was, and there was more dialogue that I, I just try to get the important part. It's fine. It's fine. Ryuji tells him that he thinks that he could, that the cousin could have made money off of her and that he probably made money off of the newspapers also. Basically calling him a mooch off of his cousin. Yeah, yeah. He was making money off of her. Yeah. You know, because she was out there yelling at the sea. You know? Oh my God. Arr. Stop. <laughs> I, I think he said that she would talk to the sea is oh, why i said oh, that oh, so she was bothering the fishermen i i think that's that's why i said that okay <laughs> she's talking to the sea again. oh my goodness <laughs> so the cousin <laughs> so sorry oh keep going <laughs> i'm done <laughs> i hate you i'm so sorry so the cousin tries to run off and ryuji grabs his hand and he sees into the past when he grabs him he sees an ESP public demonstration um, that he was he had attended, uh -huh. and when Reiku runs up uh, to help them or whatever, she gets thrown into the, the past also, so she can see what's going on. And it's Shizoku doing a demonstration and uh, in front of a bunch of men. Right, right. And um, one of the men objects, stands up, and he starts objecting and says that this is just a magic show. Then all the men say that she is deceiving the professor. They start yelling and rioting, basically. And mm -hmm. then the first man just falls over and has a twisted face, and he dies. Shizoku goes to run out and ask someone. We don't see them. Yeah. But she says, Sadaku, um... Did you do that? Yeah. So so this is how we kind of we we figure out how she's killing people. She can just like make them die. <laughs> she just wants them to up. die and they and, die. Yeah. And like I I love how the scene is set up with uh, them going into a past thought. Like it's it, that's really cool, man. It's not just a flashback, you know. Right. <laughs> like like they travel. Like it's cool. Yeah. It's fucking cool. Yeah. And how they make it look. Like, it, they have that like sepia filter. Yeah, it's a sepia it. filter, and it looks old and grainy, and yeah. it, it's really cool. It is cool. Oh, sorry. So, so Sadoko uh, here, she possesses uh, the gift of ninja. Uh, now, ninja is a uh, not ninja, ninja, <laughs> and I might be pronouncing this wrong. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm still thinking about the sea captain. Oh uh, but my god! It's it's a psychic ability that enables someone to burn images from their mind onto any solid surface just by thinking about it. So this is also how she's able to create the videotape that we have. You know, like she's created this with her mind. So that's what I mean by like Sadaku's really fucking scary because she's dead. <laughs> but her spirit is able to still retain her powers, so she's able to kill you with her fucking thoughts. So Ryuji realizes that she can kill someone just by wishing it. The cousin called her a monster. Then we see the little girl with long hair in front of her face, and she runs up to Re Reiko and grabs her arm, and she has no nails. Ooh. This is the first scene of yeah, no nails. Yeah. Then Reiko passes out. And like in for real uh -huh. life, not in the past or whatever, and has a handprint on her arm. But it's like a if someone stuck their hand in like coal. Yeah. Like it's, it's like, like black. A, yeah. And and I think like like there is like a, I don't know if you've <laughs> noticed with a lot of the spirits and stuff, the long hair hanging in front of the face. Man, that is a constant thing in Japan. Uh, Nakata has even said that like people just get scared of long hair for some reason, <laughs> long black hair. He was like, you could put long black hair on someone's pillow in Japan and it scare the fuck out of them. Oh, that's <laughs> yeah, crazy. It's cool. It's cool. The different kind of fears we have working with. And that that's what I mean by like this kind of loses some of the horror when you translate it to American, just like when you translate right. anything to American, it loses some of its uh, meaning. And I think even the horror 
loses some of that meaning when it gets remade. I think I don't know, but <laughs> yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but like, so <laughs> so I'll explain later. But I don't know if you've noticed, but like, uh, well, no, you definitely not noticed. But <laughs> Sadako is like Japan's Freddy Krueger. Like that's how big she is over in Japan. Oh she, yeah, yeah, she's a massive pop culture icon over there. Yeah, kind of like how like you know any horror fan over here is surrounded by Freddy Krueger. I got Freddy shit all over this room, and and over there you got Sadako, <laughs> which is very cool. I like that. I like that. This is their equivalent to like Freddy Krueger, right? Because she also kills people through a. A more supernatural method than just physical, you know what I mean? Right, like because she doesn't touch them. Yeah, because there's no way to escape her, you know. Uh, just like Freddy, there's not really a way to escape him unless you know you just don't sleep, <laughs> and then you can't do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But even worse, uh, Sadaku, you don't. You just you got to die. <laughs> like, <it's laughs> You're just gonna die <laughs> because we'll to get to it when we get to the end of the movie. But like again there's no way to beat it. And I think what's, what's really mean about this movie <laughs> is uh, it, kind of, it kind of betrays you a little bit because this one, unlike pulse, this one instills some hope. Like, cause you're racing against the clock. Oh, right? Yeah, and Reku yeah. are really working, trying to solve this thing. Right. And you think maybe, maybe they're going to figure it out and stop it, but it, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about no the ending, stopping it. but it fucking, <laughs> punches you in the stomach at the end of this movie <laughs> so back at the end reiko calls someone and says that shizoko killed herself and the press the professor took sadaku but nobody knows what happened to them since then and she wants whoever she's talking to on the phone uh -huh. to find them yeah she says the professor may be dead but the girls uh the girls should be in her 40s and uh, that she'll explain all of this later. Mm -hmm. Um, Ryuji says that she might be dead too. She killed a man just by wishing his death and her power was much stronger than her mother's. He goes on to say that the video is not from this world and that it's her wrath and that she put a curse on them. The guy that drove them mm -hmm. to the end, he comes in and tells them that they can't, he can't take them to the ferry because the type, the typhoon is too close and Ryoji wants to take um, any boat that he can. And so he goes to find one. Yeah. Okay, man. That was such a man fucking move. It really was. No, we're leaving. We're, we're going. leaving now. <laughs> I'm going to go find a boat. Here. I got to find a boat. <laughs> Maybe if I find one of those sea captains that she was yelling at. You oh know? my God. Stop it. I will ferry you across the <laughs> seven seas. With a fucking typhoon coming. I should say the seven maidens. <laughs> gonna go stop a long haired ghost. We're gonna have to watch that part because I guarantee I know that he said that she was talking to the ocean. <laughs> I, I I I very much believe you. It's just when you said it out loud, like it makes me think she was just just a crazy lady sitting up by the water yelling. I think that's what he said. <laughs> I think that's what he meant by that. I mean, she wasn't out there saying fucking poems or some shit. Well, she may have. I mean, that would have been. <laughs> she wasn't singing like <laughs> Kumbaya or some shit. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. Let's get back to the movie. So later, Reiko is just waiting. She then gets a call that says there is no trace of either of them. And so she starts crying for Yochi. And then remembers Izu. So she turns to find... She turns? She runs to fast. find... <laughs> she runs to find Ryuji and tells him that the, the phone didn't ring at her house. It rang at the cabin. She says that the pre professor uh, must have gotten stuck there. So they're still trying to get a boat when the cousin shows up. He says that Sudoku might, is calling them, and she might be planning to drag them into the sea. And Ryuji tells him to take them. So he does. Yeah. He was like, when she like ran up, he was trying to pay somebody like fucking yeah. take them. <laughs> okay. So Roji 
says that Sudoku probably died there long before the cabin was built. He says that they need to go find her corpse. And Reiko asks if they will, if that will lift the curse. And he says that there any, isn't anything else that they can do. Ryoji talks to the cousin and says that Shizuku used to talk to the sea. See, I told you, I did put it in there. <laughs> She would mumble things and it looked like she was having fun. He says it wasn't human language. Which do we find out why this has anything to do? She was crazy. Oh, okay. Is what they're trying to say, oh, basically. Oh. Yeah, because what's crazy about it, and we'll kind of discuss about this later, is Sadaku, you kind of feel maybe sorry for her. Yeah. Like throughout this movie, but th there's a little bit of something I picked up on that might kind of like, <laughs> she might have just been evil to begin with. <laughs> like, oh, we'll discuss it as we go. I, I don't know. There's a feeling I have. Well, I mean, look at her mother. Her mother's out there talking to the sea, okay? Hey, these she bitches, didn't, they're out she, there talking to the sea again. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't have a good start, okay? <laughs> like, and then we find out, I'll, I'll give it away, okay? We find out that the professor, probably her dad, and he's out here trying, he's doing experiments on people trying to get ESP to be a thing. Okay. Okay. So okay, she didn't, the odds were stacked against her from the beginning. Yeah, you're okay. right. You're right. Okay. I want to kill people too. Okay. <laughs> I'm just saying. Yelling at the sea. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Back to the movie. So they finally make it to Izu and drive to the cabin. When they get to the cabin, they break in underneath it and find a well. So they touch the well and it's they start to see the past again. Yeah. They see a woman looking into the well, which we know now is Sudoku. Yeah. Um, and she gets hit by a man in the head and thrown down. Then we see it uh he looks at this green. I don't know. Was he recording this? I don't fucking know. Um <laughs> And it's the professor. Uh -huh. Oh, no, he's not recording this. We fucking... We went in the past. Never mind. There's no, there's no, there's no camera crew. I was thinking... It's the sea captain. <laughs> all right, oh, my hang God. On. <laughs> Roll film. <sighs> this is all making me delusional. All right, sound. Shut the fuck up. And action, me mateys. <laughs> Brittany looks like she's gonna punch me in the head. I need to shut up. I just unplugged my charger and then I was like, I wonder if he thinks I'm like quitting. She's about to get up and leave. <laughs> so fuck this. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> You're like trying to finish it in my voice. <laughs> oh god. Anyway. Uh so Ryoji says that um the professor put the lid on and that Sudoku Am I saying that right? Sudo Sudeko? Uh, I, I, it doesn't matter. I don't know. We're going back and forth. Remember, everybody, we're from Oklahoma. I'm sorry. We're trying our best. I'm pretty sure it's Sudoku. 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 Okay. Don't try to say it too many times in a row. I think it <laughs> ruins it. We were doing just fine. Sudoku. Sudoku. Sudo okay, whatever Sudoku. I said. Whatever I yeah. said. Well, she's under there. <laughs> so they start to move the lid and point the flo the flush light. I can't. I can't, light. I can't even Whoa. say. I <laughs> can't even say American words. We okay. the, the flush light. <laughs> I can't even <laughs> gotta point the flush light. At. Oh my gosh! So they go. They Ooh. point the flashlight down. Uh -huh. And mm -hmm. they don't see anything. Yeah, so yeah. Ryoji says that he's going to go down there. And he does. Um, By the way, how do they know they were going to do all this? They have like ropes. They have buckets. Like they plan this out on I'm the boat. I'm assuming since it's a fishing village, I guess, like where they're staying at, they, there might be some ropes and buckets around, you know? So they just were like. Standard they, issue ropes they and buckets. Planned, they planned this out. Yeah, standard issue ropes and buckets. I but it was an old well. Maybe there was a rope and a bucket right next to it, you know? Uh, no, because there was a cabin on top of it. But I mean, maybe somebody didn't do their proper cleaning job, you know? Then that rope would be so untrustworthy. <laughs> well, I, I mean, what it. else are you going to do, really? <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> so as he goes down the well, he finds fingernails embedded in the walls. And he says that Sadoko was still alive. Ooh. And he's Wait. he's creeped out. Yeah, which is a very creepy 
part of the story because yes. she went down there alive and stuff. So that means she was trying to claw her way out, which is. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. So Reiko lowers these buckets into the water so they can see deeper into the well. Like she's lowering them uh -huh. and then picking them up or pulling them back up and pouring them out. They're doing this for a long time. And they are pushing their time limit because this is yeah. the last day, yeah. like the last hours. And Reiko gets really weak and she ends up passing out. So Ryuji gets out of the well and says that they need to switch. And Reiko's like, no. Hell, fuck that. She's fucking done. She's tired. She's ready to die. No, I'm just kidding. She's not ready to die. <laughs> so he slaps her and tells her she needs to think about Yochi. So Reiko ends up... Um, going into the well, and when she does, she sees the professor's face, and uh, for some reason she gets a flash of that. Yeah, and she keeps asking Sadoko where she is. She's like, "Where are you? I, like, show yourself, whatever." Yeah, and then Reiko pulls up hair from the water, and Sadoko grabs her arm, and she so slowly comes out of the water, and all we see is the hair in front of the face. And then the hair moves, and it's just a skeleton. Yeah, it would just, By the way. Yeah, oh, yeah. Hold on. <laughs> it looks like this skeleton is crying. Yeah. Because there's, like, goo or something coming out of the eye sockets. Yeah. Which makes it look like the skeleton's crying. It's a very, really, like, I keep saying creepy, but, like, it's a very weird effect how it they is. do this here. And, and it's spooky. And it, that made me sad. Yeah, well, like you, like you, like I said, like I think it really, I feel like it tricks you here. Yeah, because and we'll discuss my feelings of the ending and your feelings of the ending here in a minute. But like, I feel like it kind of tricks you into feeling bad for seduction. Yes, it does. Yeah, very much so for yeah. me. Yeah, Reiko hugs her, and Ryoji says it's past seven ten, so they are good. They did yeah. it. They ended the curse. Yay. So they're out of the well now, and the police are there. Reiko asks why he killed his own daughter, and Ryoji says that maybe she wasn't his daughter, and he wonders he wonders if her father was even human. He notices that her marks are gone off of Reiko's arm, uh -huh. and he says it's over, and they drive home. He drops her off and goes home to finish his work. Yes. And, and like I said, again, they set you up for what's about to come here. Like they yeah. give you a little bit of hope and stuff and they yeah. build that up. They build that hope up, uh, make you think, oh, the curse is lifted. We're all good. Just wait. <laughs> just wait. Just wait. Army matey, just wait for it. <laughs> <laughs> the sea captain's still here. So I I nope. think I think everything's nope. <laughs> I think everything's nope. improved with a sea captain, isn't it? No, <laughs> definitely not. Okay, go on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. For some reason, the sea captain makes me think of Mr. Krabs. <laughs> and I just Army can't. Krabby Patty formula. Exactly. Oh, God. Exactly. <laughs> okay, moving on. <laughs> so the next day, Ryoji is still working and he hears something and turns around and the TV is on. And it's showing the well. And he watches it. And Sudoku slowly comes out of it and walks towards the TV. The phone rings and he answers it, but he doesn't say anything. He just picks it up. Uh -huh. And as he does this, Sudoku starts to crawl through the TV. She stands up and walks towards him as he fumbles over everything. And as he looks at her, you see her eye. It like Ooh. zooms into her Ooh, eye. That eye gets you, man. It is this shit will scare the fuck out of you oh, if you're yeah. watching it alone on a dark night. Oh yeah. Again, ghost story. Uh but okay. So like to get this effect. Hold on. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. And then he dies. Yeah, then he dies. <laughs> I just wanted to <laughs> <Arr>. <laughs> yes. Okay, but anyway. Um <laughs> but to get to get this effect, they had this actress uh walk backwards towards the TV. 
uh, to get this jangly effect. Because, okay, first of all, when I say jangly effect or something like that, or this etchy kind of movements and stuff like that, yeah, I know a lot of us are thinking like how we do it here in America with the CGI. You know, we make everything move all fucking weird and discombobulated nowadays. We think, again, just like we thought warped faces were scary, we now think <laughs> jangly bodies are scary as fuck nowadays, and so we're stuck on it. But like, no, with this, they just filmed someone doing this backwards. So she walked backwards and they put it in reverse. Oh, that makes sense. To make sense. it look yeah. like it. And, and uh, very little CGI used in this movie, by the way. Probably yeah, only probably like when just, she comes out of the TV. Just when she comes out of the TV, which is an effective shot. Yeah. Like it's still creepy as you go because I think one of the reasons why that's so fucking scary is it's because it's portraying something that cinema has set up with audiences <laughs> for <laughs> time on end is the reality ends where the screen begins. You know, right. like the things that are in the screen are not supposed to come out and harm you but here they do so it's kind of like a betray of that trust which i right. think it, it's creepy as shit man just oh, to yeah. think about i don't know just the thought about watching a, something and you're like this is creepy and then it just fucking comes out of the television and tries to kill you that's fucking horrifying yes it is <laughs> it's like oh fuck oh fuck yes yes and so anyway also um, now, the actress who plays, which, by the way, you never see Sudoku's face in this movie. Just her eyeball. Yeah, just her eyeball. And that's actually just a crew person. Uh, it, was a, it was a male to get the eye looking like just right. They picked yeah. one guy on the crew and he chopped. If you notice, he cut his eye, eye uh, brows and uh, uh, eyelashes off oh, to, shit. to get that like. It is I, It's hard to explain. It's it is so hard to explain. fucking frightening. It's mostly... The white of the eye, yes, with the uh, with the colored part, like in the corner. I don't know how to explain yeah. it. Yeah, and and, it's, just, and, and we hold on that eye for not not too long, but we hold on it for a minute, and you're just yeah. like, oh fuck. <laughs> yeah, this is the closest to a jump scare. This is yeah. yes, yes, it, and it's a shock, and I don't know. Okay. I don't know how much you remembered of that original American version, but like, did you see this twist come in here? No, because it is a twist. I mean, like I said, they set up hope and stuff and they th you they make you think they broke the curse. Right. And then bam. <laughs> and then this happens. Yeah. yeah. No, I didn't imagine <laughs> that. So the person that had called was Reiku. Uh -huh. And so she hears uh, um, all this happening. Yeah. Um, so she goes to check on him and a police officer stops her and uh, says that they already took the body away. Then she sees his student from earlier and yeah. the student was the one that found him. She says that he was uh, laying on the floor and she is freaked. She was freaked out by his face. Reiko is questioning why she was uh, the only one saved by this. Yeah. By finding uh, Sadoka's body. Mm -hmm. And she, so she takes the tape from his apartment and goes home. Yeah. When Reiko gets home, she sees a person through the reflection on the TV before she even turns it on. And it, it's a person with the towel on her head pointing at her bags. Which I think, is that Ryuji? I Which think it we is. Saw, we saw the person with the towel on their head earlier in the tape. Um, which begs the question, is that him in the tape too? Is Sadako able to see the future? Did she know all this was happening the whole time? That this was her plan just to fuck with him? I don't know. Which, by the way, is what I meant by like, I don't think she was good to begin with. I don't think there was like a sad little girl. I think she was evil. Like, because he even oh, mentions, yeah. yeah, he even mentions that like, what if her uh, father wasn't even human or something right. like that. And I think what happened was, I think she drove her own mother insane Oh. Made her mother kill herself. And then the professor dude, he tried to kill her because he knew all this. And, you know, and, and then it didn't yeah, work. So yeah. So I think she's just evil. <laughs> like, I don't think. I agree. Yeah. yeah. And, it, it, and it makes you like, I don't know, like just that alone where you're like, oh, oh, yeah, fuck all this. There's no escape from this shit. She just likes it. It right, just makes right. it even scarier, <laughs> right. you know. So uh, she grabs her copy of the tape out of the bag and she's looking at them uh -huh. and she realizes that uh, she keeps saying to herself, what did I do? 
that he didn't do. Yeah. We did all of these things. Yeah, the same. Why did he die before her? And she's right. still alive. Yeah. What did she, she do different? When she realizes that what she did that Ryuji didn't do was copy the tape. Mm -hmm. So she takes her VCR and the tapes to her dad's. Um, but we'll, we see her driving, but we hear her call her dad on the phone before she leaves. And she says, dad, um, I have a favor to ask of you. It's for Yochi. Oh, yeah. It's like this ending. Fuck. <laughs> Cause yeah, she realizes that I'm going to tell oh, you, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm it. sorry. I was jumping ahead. My bad. Go ahead. So as she's driving, we're hearing from those girls in the beginning, um, that were interviewed, uh, -huh. uh they're talking about how uh, this is the way to lift the curse. You have to copy the tape and make somebody else watch it. And then that person has to copy the tape, make somebody yeah. else watch it. And that's what saves them. So what she's doing is she's asking her dad to watch this tape. And she's going to have Yochi make a copy of it. Yeah. which is Like make a copy of it and yeah. then get, have her dad watch it. Yeah. And she wants her dad to die. And then it'll end the curse. Will it end the curse, though? Or will it revert back? See, I, we don't know. I don't think so. Yeah. I think it ends the curse because it, it saves Yochi. The dad dies. And then if nobody else sees any more tapes, like if she destroys uh -huh. the tapes, it's done. But what if you have to keep making... I don't know. It's just... <laughs> I, would I mean, like she already fucked with everybody here <laughs> by making us all think she was just a sad girl. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, see what I mean? Like, I don't know. I don't know. Again, I'm saying this not have seen the sequel in like years. I don't remember the sequels. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to check out those sequels again. There's quite a few. Uh, but anyway. <laughs> But no, man, this ending fuck as they drive off and the clouds all gloomy and shit and like that. It's just a gut punch. Oh, yeah. You're in depression town pretty fast, which, by the way, uh, more on the similarities between this and Candyman, which I know, again, sounds ridiculous, but that's how Candyman lives on. He has people keep telling his story. Right. Keep the urban legend going to keep him alive. Which makes me think that's what I mean by like, maybe her goal, maybe that doesn't end the curse. Maybe you need to keep the tapes going. Keep people Ooh, seeing it. You right. know what I mean? That's another thing, which is really fucking scary. I don't know. It's it, this whole fucking concept freaks me the fuck out. But um, <laughs> <laughs> which I think, man, in today's society with uh, TikTok and stuff, man, Sudoku would have a blast. <laughs> <laughs> everybody be dead <laughs> it's true but uh ring was released in japan on january 31st 1998 which by the way this feels like such a timeless movie yeah there's not a lot of cell phones in it or anything like that or any modern technology which which is nice because you don't i mean besides you know uh, vhs and vcr but that can you can write that off people are obsessed with vhs and vcr these days anyway right so so that doesn't feel too bad but it feels like a, it feels very timeless but it was distributed by toho films and it became japan's highest grossing film in the country uh, also it was shown at the 1999 fantasia film festival where it won first place in the asian films selection um the most surprising thing is in hong kong it beat out american films which american films i don't know if i've touched on this but american films play huge over there in japan oh really yeah you might hear that a lot like we're like uh, marvel and disney and stuff like that like big blockbusters like to play to the asian market like china and japan and stuff because that's where we make a shit ton of money oh yeah like because they love it like one of our biggest exports is movies <laughs> like yeah uh, like we can kind of be proud about that but <laughs> <laughs> But the most surprising thing ever, though, you guys, is that um, it, the movie beat out The Matrix back then, which wow. I don't know if anybody remembers how big the fucking Matrix is. So it beat out The Matrix. And uh, but, but we didn't really get it on home video until 2003 after the American remake had been released. Wow. So so if you're feeling like, well, why the fuck have I never seen? You know, it, it may be because of that, because it came out on video and I don't remember it getting much fanfare. 
you know, if you're just a casual horror viewer and stuff like that, you may not have even heard that there was a Japanese. You know, well, I ring. didn't. Yeah, exactly. So, so you know, <laughs> and that, I'd seen the f- remake. Yeah, like you a saw the remake. Times, yeah. uh, and and so that's another reason why I really wanted to do this series. You know, to get get the you know word out because for our casual horror viewers, which like we you know on Night of the Horror File, casual and big horror buffs are all welcome here. You know, um, we don't gatekeep a genre like most people, <laughs> so so you're allowed to only like a handful of horror movies and still be a horror fan. Right. So so but that's why we did this, you know, or that's why I did this to to kind of get this out there so people could see it because I feel like this is much better than the remake. Uh, in terms of this story. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Yeah, we'll get to that in a minute. But um <clears throat> And okay, I know we kind of touched on the American remake, you know, mm-hmm. throughout this thing, kind of touched, Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which we will, I mean, obviously we're going to cover that at some point on the show. So, you know, we won't, I'm, <laughs> I didn't go full into my thoughts on that because we're saving that for when we do cover the remake. But, um, but I don't know. I, I still think it's a good movie. It's just not a good horror movie anymore. I, I, not to me. Um, while The Ring from 1998, I feel like this movie gets scarier every time I watch it. Like, because it's another one where it's like, it has rewatchability because you start noticing little things and you're like, oh. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You start picking up on it. It has a very thick uh, story, too. Right. That you may have missed a few things. But anyway, uh, sequels. Yes, in Japan, Ring from 1998 had a shit ton of sequels, including one sequel that was released the same year as this. Yeah, uh, titled what? Yeah, titled Spiral. In Japan, they do this quite often. Um, they'll they'll release like this. They'll they'll work on a sequel right after that one because they know this one's going to get so much uh, popularity and stuff. So hey, why not fucking do a sequel right after that? Because you could make a ton of money. Yeah, doing that. They're, yeah, they're very efficient. By the way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't think we touched on this, but the the Japanese are very are workhorses, man. Uh, yeah, we know. We yeah. get most of our shit from there. Yeah. yeah so so the, you know, so <laughs> so they had a sequel and it was titled Spiral. But it had really poor reception, so it's often forgotten. Uh oh. to the point where it's nicknamed the Forgotten Ring sequel. You know, because uh it, it later the, in I think it was 1999 that a uh, ring two was released. So they went back and made another sequel. <laughs> oh, dang. <laughs> yeah. They made a better sequel, which I'm <laughs> like, can we fucking start doing that here in America? If like a sequel sucks, we just go back and fucking do a better Let's sequel. Let's fix our mistakes. I, yeah. I think we're literally doing that now. When I think about it with the Halloween movies that are coming out, <laughs> they're like, hey, let's make a better sequel. Oh, you think so? Yeah. It just takes us 10 years to fucking do it. <sighs> but anyway, uh, then you had a prequel called ring zero, uh, birthday. What? What? Which, again, that's the American translation. It's actually called something uh, quite interesting <laughs> over there. Right. But that's what it's called here. Uh, but it's a prequel, and it was released in 2000. And, of course, Ring, uh, the final chapter, is a television series that came out as well. I think you can catch that on Netflix. I haven't watched it, but uh, I heard I heard good things. But most surprisingly... <laughs> Like I said, is Sadako is a pop culture icon in Japan. Yeah. And and as I stated, you know, she's the equivalent of their Freddy Krueger. And even throwing out the she she threw out the first pitch during a baseball game. What? Yes, they had Sadako come out <laughs> of the Jumbotron, <laughs> mind you. Ring remains the flame that started the J-horror fire here in America. Like I said, it's not it, it's not the first Japanese uh, remake. Uh, you know, it's not the first time we started remaking Japanese movies, but it's definitely the one that changed our genre, man. Right. Uh, the influence this thing had on future future films and stuff. I don't think without the J-horror boom and without this movie specifically, I don't think we would have gotten Sidious. I don't think we would have got The Conjuring, all those kind of movies that feel like this one do yeah uh yeah. we would never have gotten those uh, so so we owe a great deal of gratitude to 1998's <laughs> ring but enough about my blow jobs of this movie <laughs> whoa <laughs> i've been sucking this movie off for like an hour and a half but what did you think about 1998's ring i liked it because it kept me on my ed- on my edge on the edge 
<laughs> we on the edge. All right, keep me on the edge. Stop. <laughs> I knew as soon as I said that you were going to say something I'm like so that. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Continue. Continue. Now you're making me on the edge of the plank and makes me want to <laughs> fucking jump off of that shit. <laughs> anyway. um, No, it kept me on edge because I didn't know what was going to happen. And I like that. Yeah. It, I it, really like It's not that. only a good horror movie. I feel like it's a good movie. Yeah. I think that's the most important part, especially like when it comes to horror in general, you know, a lot of these things survive on their story. You know, you, you have one or two ways a horror movie can go it, with the special effects and the gore. It's so bad. It's good to watch, you know, or, or it's fun yeah. or you have one with such a good story <clears throat> and it's and it, it is scary that it remains like in the foyer, you know. It remains on your mind. Right, you know? right. And I think this one really is not, you know, even if it wasn't a horror movie, it's still a good movie. Right, right. I I think I'll forever remember this one. The remake. Uh, I remember a girl I, walking you, through a TV. I'm telling you, I barely remember the remake. Yeah. And I saw it quite a few times. I saw it in theaters. I do remember it being scary, but it's been a while. Like, I want to say that I watched it in theaters also. I know I had to have watched it. It's with been a, a while, but I remember like I revisited it like five years ago, I think. And like I said, it just it just felt funny. Right. And I was like, right. oh, that sucks. Like, cause you don't want that in your movie that's supposed to be horror. Like you right. don't you don't want to revisit it and it's an unintentionally funny now because I guess of, I should say, okay, back when uh -huh. when it came out and we watched it in the theaters and stuff like that, it was scary. Oh, it scared the shit out of me. Right. So like a first time viewer watching it, scary. Yeah, probably. I think if you, you know watched I mean? it one time. But this one, each time I watch it, I'm still kind of freaked out a little bit. Like it still has that Oh, the Japanese one. Yeah, yeah. the Japanese one. I think yeah. it still holds that candle. Yeah. I don't know. Like I said, there's something about it, like I said, I'm very harsh on uh, these <laughs> movies that remake Japanese movies or remakes of any other country's movies in general. I'm I'm really harsh on them because you're taking something that's traditionally this country's storytelling. Right. And you're transplanting to America. And honestly, honestly, you know, we sound like we're hating on it, but the ring from 2002, you know, Gore Verbinski's ring, it it is probably the best of the Japanese remakes. Oh, I see that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's probably the best uh, because, well, because I think uh, they, they more discussed it more closely with. Uh, um, and, and I know I know a lot of people are probably yelling at me because a lot of people consider The Grudge to be the superior remake, mostly because the director of the original Jew on The Grudge directed the remake and stuff like that. But I, I, I don't hold that opinion. <laughs> I don't hold that opinion. I think uh, a Gore Verbinski, I don't think was afraid to try to adapt this style, this feel. You know? Oh yeah. Yeah. Did you find it scary? It was spooky. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's not scream out loud, scary or anything no. like that, but it's get under your skin, scary, which kind of how his pulse was. And you know what? If we had a home phone, I would disconnect it <laughs> for a little while. Because Brittany has been jumpy all I've been this so month. Jumpy. She's been jumpy. Oh my gosh. Which I guess we should probably talk about uh next month. Next month's Halloween, man. And uh Halloween. which by the way, if you're a member of our Patreon and you listen to shooting the shit over there, you've already heard this lineup, which I'm not gonna tell you guys the lineup, but I will tell you that Brittany has picked the theme this month and she's picked the movies. And uh, next month's theme for Halloween, we're going back to slasher territory yes. with Slasherama Part 2. That's right. Uh, I think our first Slasherama, we covered Halloween. We covered Nightmare on Elm Street. We covered Friday the 13th, I believe. I think uh, so. Maybe. <laughs> I don't remember. That it's was a year so ago. Fucking, no, no, that, that was, was like two, two years, years ago. ago. It's been so long ago, but we covered the big heavy hitters. This time around, we're going to cover some of the 2000s slasher movies sounds about me yes because <laughs> you know i yes. like that shit and we're gonna cover uh apparently our cat wants to be part of the the, oh. the podcast okay <laughs> He's rubbing his face on guest starring mr taco um <laughs> but anyway <laughs> um, 
<laughs> but anyway, we're going to be visiting some of those 2000 slashers, man. So so keep that in mind. That'll kind of give you a hint at what's to come. Uh, I'm not going to say what's next week. <gasps> You're right. not. Yeah, you guys are going to have to be surprised. You, surprise, you'll find, surprise. Well, you'll find out midweek. <laughs> you'll find out Wednesday. I always announce the new <laughs> movies on Wednesday. But uh, by the way, you know, head on over to Patreon if you guys haven't already. It's a lot of fun over there. I'm going to start sending out physical little goodies and note cards, stickers. And I got stickers coming. I'm going to try to get some like free movie codes, just throw at you guys. Every time I buy so many movies that like I get these new movies and I have codes that I never use. Because I'm like, <laughs> I got the movie right here. Why the fuck do I need? So, right, so I'll, right. I'm going to start sending our Patreons those little codes. Because why not? You know, that's cool. They're just going to get thrown away. So, right. <laughs> so free right. movies for the Patreons. So you guys are going to get freebies uh, over there. There's like, oh god, there's so many hours of content now. Because shooting the shit is a weekly show that hits an hour to an hour and a half weekly. Uh, monthly, you're getting uh, the Bruce or the Campbell Hour. Which uh, we talk about Bruce Campbell projects and uh, movies and television shows over there. Right now we're covering Ash vs. Evil Dead. And uh, you're also getting Damn Fine Peaks, which we're going through Twin Peaks. And we're also sneaking in some David Lynch movies in there to, uh, to talk about. Uh, much to <laughs> Brittany's <laughs> d- dismay. dismay. She is not... <laughs> She enjoys Twin Peaks, though. But, yes, but yes. lots of fun stuff to come in the future and stuff like that. And you're also going to get updates on projects that I'm working on and stuff like that, like movies and side projects. And I'm working on a radio station sort of thing that's like going to be a special event thing. Okay. Uh, to debut around the holidays. So around Halloween this year, that's going to come out. Um, that's kind of a solo thing of mine, so so you guys keep a lookout for that. But lots of stuff over on Patreon. Uh, I'm I, let's end this out. I'm Lee Evans, saying stay spooky, and I'm Brittany. Stay horrific. Konnichiwa, everybody. That's how you ended it last week. Yeah. Is that hello? Did I just say hello to everybody? I thought that was thank you. I don't know. Konnichiwa. No, that's hello. Ah, oh, fuck. Sayonara, everybody. Bye. Bye. Army matey. Thanks for listening. To get a hold of us and submit your stories, fan mail, and death threats, you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and nightofthehorrorfile.com. Our theme song was written and performed by John Brennan. Used with permission. Find John at shopjb.bandcamp.com and at badtechno.com. If you like what you hear, leave a good review wherever you listen to podcasts and share the show on your social media. See you next week.